it, I um, <clears throat> I got. I want to say I don't want to say attacked, but it kind of was. Oh wasn't. shit! Yeah, basically, um, from where was I? I was in this place called Andover, and <clears throat> I've had a lot of people message me going, "Oh, Andover's not that much of a shit hole," all this kind of thing, and I was just like, "Eh." Yeah, okay. okay. I'm not too sure about that, but basic long and short of it, I was, um, as I was, it was probably about 10, half 10 at night, and I was riding from, um, through Andover, and I cut into a park to have a piss, as you would, mm -hmm. pretty standard. Uh, and I had a bunch of guys come up to me and sort of try and push me off the bike and take the bike. Cool. Yeah, really nice. Yeah. You're okay though. Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. I'm a bit. I, I was a bit rattled up by it. Um, the didn't. And you were alone. I was on my own. Yeah, didn't get. Yeah, didn't get pushed off the bike. So managed to not have the bike stolen. Um, and then we were filming it. The whole thing was being filmed. So you okay? So, but but that that didn't get filmed. Um, okay. The guys that were filming were like half an hour up the road. Um, oh, but basically, it was all being filmed for Shimano, and I saw the guys like half an hour afterwards, and they were like, "Are you all right?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> no, I'm not all right." And they were like, "What's happened?" They explained the situation to them, and they were like, "Okay, let's just stop for the evening and yeah. put a camper van. Let's stop for the evening and see how you feel in the morning, and we can then we decide whether you want to." carry on all that sort of thing and we took part up the camper van slept for the night and i was just like don't want to ride my bike i literally don't want to ride my bike i've i very rarely have ever been like i don't want to go for a cycle and literally just no motivation to cycle or anything i was just like nah done so we stopped pulled the pin on it um, so loud. yeah it's frustrating because i was doing it for to raise money for charity as well like and doing it for basically to raise awareness for testicular cancer. I was gonna say it would be really ironic if it was like an anti-bullying charity or something, but like. <laughs> the, the, the irony of it being testicular cancer and a bunch of guys, and I think the statistics are, it's like, I think it was five blokes. Oh, and one of them will probably get it. At least one of those five will have to have tests uh to see if you know at least one of them is going to have an abnormal lump at some point in their life but yeah. probably more than one and it is very frustrating in a situation where yeah you know you're trying to do something for a good cause and just get a big old literally a slap in the face um and so yeah the last week has been uh basically me dealing with the police trying to work out what we could do I'm uh, guessing not much, huh? Nothing. Because um, the, no, it happened in a park, there's no CCTV. Right. Um, I didn't have a camera on me or anything. Um, they didn't actually get anything. They just... So it's not like you can track where it's being resold because they didn't steal your bike, so... Yeah, but the bike... Maybe it helps. Yeah. Story. Maybe in a week, you'll be able to take whatever footage you have and then it stops suddenly. Yeah. And then you can talk about what happened and then actually say, statistically, one in five of those guys... And then you can cut it there. Yes. Yeah, so what we what we we had a it might big, have more of an impact and raise more yeah. awareness than you know. So we had a big chat about this. Um, I've started recording because I thought bugger it. I'm oh. going to start recording. <laughs> so you know. Okay. Um, purely because I was like, fuck it, I'm going to start recording. I just was in that okay. mindset. That I knew I knew I would probably forget. Okay. I've done that before where I forgot to record and then realised an hour has gone past which is never good. Uh, so anyway, we had a big chat with Shimano about it. And they were like, what, they very honestly were like, what is, what's your stance on it, Chris? And I was like, well, it was shit. Um, I would like to do it again, but I'm not certain when I would like to have another go. Um, and then we kept talking about it quite a bit. And we were talking like what we could do with what we've already got. Like I got over halfway. I was 400 kilometers into it. It was 600 and 
90 kilometers in total. Uh, I got 400k done in like 15 hours. So it's pretty damn good. I was pretty chuffed with that. And anyway, we were like, what, what do you want to do? Like, do you want to, we they were like, do you want to go to the point where you, the incident happens and then carry on riding the remaining 290k? Or do you want to start from scratch? Do you want to, what would you like to do? And I just, I sat there and I thought about it for a while and I was like, do you know what? I'd like to do it again from the start and do it properly. And they were like, right. When are you thinking about doing it? And I was like, I don't know, maybe the end of May. And they were literally like, what? Seriously? And I was like, yeah, well, I'd rather get it done and not have to, this kind of done then. Like it's, it will eat away at me if I, if I keep waiting. I reckon you should do a call out. You should talk about it publicly and then do a call out to get as many cyclists as you can to join you for that part yeah. and go through that park with a, with like a crazy amount of cyclists for like safety. And that will raise more awareness than anything. <laughs> It'd be quite funny. Like I, I didn't, so when I did the first one, I very intentionally didn't talk about it because just be, primarily, basically, un, I think until the day before, purely because of the COVID restrictions in the UK at the yeah. moment. And because I knew that if I talked about it, people would like make arrangements to like come out and ride, yeah. with it, which is fine. But I, you know, I felt like I was maybe pushing the limits and the regulations yeah. out there anyway, as it was by cycling across the country. Um, but in the UK anyway, the restrictions are lifting day by day, really. Every week it's a new, yeah. Um, but we're, they're looking here, the plan is to be locked down, completely lifted by the 21st of June, which is crazy. Um, anyway, my... Can go back to their weather spoons for a Taco Tuesday or whatever it is. <laughs> oh my god weather spoons yeah there's one of them where i now live and it's the busiest place still in London. was it a theater or a bank before it was a weather spoons uh actually do you know what i think it was just a pub before okay but there is definitely a standard that they're old cinemas or banks or something isn't it sometimes bingo halls <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway how are you I'm all right yeah Going Where to are, sunny Girona. I was gonna say, are you in are you in Girona right now? Mm-hmm. Is it sunny? Mm-hmm. It's 24 degrees today. Going to the beach later. So <laughs> you know what we, we've had in the UK this morning and lit yesterday, we had snow. Yeah, and isn't it election day today? It is uh okay. like local council election day. So your local uh, you know, you're a local politician in the area you live in, which is quite ironic for me because I only moved here two months ago, so I don't even know who they are. But um, so, where are you? I I am in uh, the border of the Peak District now. Oh, you're up so, the north. Yeah, moved out of London uh, okay. two maybe two and a half months ago. Um, okay. And there's there was definitely this. A lot trend. of people have in the last year left London. So. Yeah, massively so. There's been this trend. All of my mates have left. They've yeah. gone from. They've literally gone from being in, you know, central London to I think the furthest north is uh, like Durham, Newcastle way. Oh, wow, okay. And they've all gone, but the majority have gone north because it's, mm. it's so much cheaper. Like the amount you can get for your money is crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, I, don't, I think, yeah, Newcastle, Durham, Peak District, <clears throat> and York. That's where everyone's gone, of my, like, close group of mates. Mm -hmm. um, but there has definitely been, I think, lockdown in the UK anyway made a lot of people in cities realise that don't, you don't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Like, working yeah. from home, working remotely, it kind of opened up that option. And I think a lot of, I, read, I heard something in the news today that was saying that the top, 50 company the top top i don't know what top 50 they are but the top 50 companies in the uk top 50 what like top 50 haribo sweet eating companies i don't know mm. be anything but the top 50 companies have said they're going to they're not going to enforce returning back to offices uh, which is pretty pretty nuts um and I, I, I think the stance on it has definitely meant that there's a more of an acceptance of home working. Um, mm. 
Mm. And, you know, we've t- kind of technically in the UK, we've been in the current lockdown since November, really. I know. Um, and before that, it was, you know, on no, and Because I was there in December, like right when there was like a little break. Like I yeah. came right and it was, but I mean, honestly, I was so confused. I got there and was like, well, the pubs are open and the government says it's okay. So we're all going to the pubs. And I'm like, pubs are not ventilated people. <laughs> like, what yeah. is this? Like, just because the government said you can open pubs, like, just brains down. And then unsurprisingly, like two weeks later, it was like, eh, we're going back into lockdown. Was that at the start of December then? Yeah. Yeah. Because they, it was like regional lockdowns before then. Yeah. And then they, there was this like promise that, oh, you'd be able to go and see your families and stuff for Christmas. And then it was like, pow, no. And then, yeah, I know. And it's crazy because I think we've been really lucky in Spain and Andorra for just being in small towns. Yeah. Like we don't realize how easy it is kind of because even though Girona feels like a city to us because it's quite compact, it's like it's like 90,000 people here. So it just doesn't have that same, like I didn't feel safe in London. I was like, ah, there's so many people. Nobody's wearing masks. I don't know who these people are, you know? Yeah. Here, so everybody's quite like compliant and chill and everything's outside because it's Spain so like all the restaurants are open but they're all you just sit outside so yeah it's definitely a I mean you're lucky you have the conditions to be able to do that here is it here like loads of restaurants and stuff have reopened and but you have to eat outside so you're going to them with as many layers as you can <laughs> and you, get, you turn up in the massive puffer jackets and no um, we've done that a couple of times recently and i've just been like this is this is not enjoyable i'd rather just stay at home and eat like cook and take away yeah why yeah. why not but it's 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 been such an interesting like thing I, t- I mean it's incredibly sad how many people have passed away obviously and how many people it's affected in their lives when you talk about work mental health all that kind of side of it but it's also incredibly interesting to see how different countries have coped and have been affected by it how you know we've never seen anything like this in our lifetime you know I think just from like my perspective I was I I got made redundant and I was just like fuck it I'm gonna try and make it work do what I can on my own and see if I can make it work and um see if I can make a job by doing I don't really know what I'm doing half the time, but see if I can make it work mm. as a job and a career. And and then also choosing to move out of London, which was, a, as I say, quite a big decision, but I ultimately feel like for my own and my partner's own like mental health, the right decision. You know, we now have a national park on our doorstep. We have three floors of a house as opposed to a little flat, you know? Yeah, he's... Uh, I've, now you only have two days of summer compared to two weeks <laughs> yeah yeah true. i think we've had them as well i think we've had those two days as it is but yeah it's been fascinating to see how the world's kind of cope with it and it, and obviously the situation in like india oh. brazil etc is yeah. that's really horrible and then i have to tell you that sometimes like when we when i've been traveling to bike races this year there is this feeling of like why is this happening like there is a real feeling of like really mm, yeah like i don't know maybe it's just me but i'm like this doesn't seem like it's a necessity but yeah, yeah so it's it's been fascinating to see that so many races have gone ahead there's so few who have actually been cancelled i can I probably count it on my hands how many the the more well known ones anyway there's obviously yeah. loads of smaller races have been cancelled but a lot of the more Compared to last year when it was like, oh, there's another one cancelled, there's another one cancelled, there's another one cancelled, or, or rescheduled. This year it feels like there's been a very... There's con- been enough but, to keep it going. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's been enough... Apparently to keep- the Belgian government was like, we're having this because people were getting so depressed in Belgium about not having bike racing that they were like, we've got to do it and put it on TV for our population. It's so the national sport in Belgium, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So they really like it was really this huge thing from the Belgian government to be like, we're doing it. So which is kind of cute, actually. When you think yeah. Right. So I think what's like for me, what fascinates me about you is you literally get to see so many races firsthand, document it, yeah. kind of 
just talk about it and really live and breathe the life of what is actually going on. Like, yeah, yes. And I can, <laughs> like, do I? Yeah, much more so yeah. than uh, the majority of people. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and also being Girona based, you're, you. I mean, there's so many of like the Spanish races out there, which are in pretty close proximity to you, really. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's always been really fascinating kind of like uh, the photography stuff as well some of the photos are beautiful oh thanks <laughs> i think what one i saw recently it was a the time some time trial ones who knows <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah it's just like it's been really nice to follow what you're doing you. over i don't even know how many years it's probably been now i don't know i've lost track i it's just a, the endless circus isn't it um was it were the time trial photos of Alex? They very well could have been. <laughs> probably, probably. probably. So. He's off to the Giro again. He is at the Giro, I know. So. But I have not uh, properly spoken to that that silly sausage for quite a while, actually. Mm-hmm. I saw that. Oh. It, I should call him just out of the blue and call him. Um, yeah, I just video call him in now. He'd be like, "What do you guys want?" <laughs> Well, you know what you'd get? You'd get the grumpy face. Yeah. Which his daughter has the same face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she really does, doesn't she? It's very sweet. It's very sweet. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I don't know what my time trial photos were. I'll have to look, look, look through it and work it out. But yeah, no, I do go to a lot of races. And I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's a different perspective. I don't know. Um, you know, I live in Girona, so I live in it. They're not like, it's kind of a little bit of everything, having like the background in journalism and starting through journalism and then clearly being married to a professional cyclist has like shifted that into more of a content creator because you can't be a straight journalist when you're, you know, and do like like hardcore reporting when you have coffee and dinner with the people because there's no way to not have the bias. Yeah. So maybe just made my own niche out of it because out of necessity. Um, it's fun. It's, you know, it's crazy. It's I'm off to Basque country in a few days. It's nice to, it's really nice to go to the races, like especially some of the women's races that yeah. don't get a lot of coverage because you actually get to show that story a bit more. Yeah, um, it does feel like, so for, there's a few things you've mentioned there, which I'm going to go to quickly. Your partner, name your partner. Nathan Haas. What was he? What's his next race? He's actually going to Majorca next week for the four days of Majorca Challenge. It's been a bit. He got really sick, so I don't know if people saw he had he had COVID at some point. We don't really know when yeah. because he was getting tested like three times a week. He never had a te- positive test for it, which is like I swear never returned a positive test and it has a whole new meaning in 2021. I think Alex actually said that last year as well. <laughs> yeah. um, but then he has the antibodies and he was really sick. So we don't know when that happened. Um, so they're just starting him again with Mallorca after a really big break from the variety yeah. of stuff that happens. It's not fun, yeah. but he's excited to get back to racing. Um, he's in Andorra this week, actually training. So. Yeah. I've seen he's been out there in Andorra uh, yeah. riding around. Lucky sod. Um, Except it's cold. Uh, yeah. It's so. Yeah, but it's still pretty. Yeah, it is. Still really pretty. <laughs> so, and like, if anyone doesn't know Nathan, Nathan's raced free. I mean, previously he was at Dimension Data for a long time, wasn't he? It was two years. It was only two years. Only he, was, years. Yeah. he was at Garmin, Dimension yeah. Data, Katusha, and now he's with Kofidis. So. Yeah, it was Katusha as well, wasn't it? I forgot yeah. about that one. And Kofidis now. And kind of, I mean, you know, pretty, it feels like he's kind of in a, that team feels like it's a re, actually improved a lot recently with the kind of riders they've signed. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's some, um, getting Elia Viviani as well. That was pretty damn cool. Um, who I, I, everyone says is one of the nicest men in the world. Yes. Uh, and. This is Guillaume Martin. Is just like, I just really love Guillaume Martin's whole vibe. Like, like, I mean, the dude's written a book about philosophy and cycling. Like, I don't know. I feel like somehow, you know, it's a, like the French cycling thing has been so just like myopically focused on Pino and Bardet for so long. I think it's now the time to talk about Guillaume Martin. Yeah. You know, like, 
Yes, it's tricky. I mean, Pino, I really like him. And I think the reason why I really like him is his goats. Yeah. I, that, I mean, that for me, I think is so adorable and makes him really like human as well. And um, it was, was it last year when he, was it last year or was it the year before when he had to stop in the Tour de France because of his back or something? Both? <laughs> I, don't, yeah. I think it was last year. <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah. it was a time, I think it was, the one that I'm thinking of, I think is 2019 when he... He yeah, lost a bunch of time on a stage in Crosswinds. I actually have a photo of it. It's like, um, I'm gonna find the photo of this. I was a great photo, so. And so it started, it was like in the middle of the race and he lost a bunch of time in a crosswind stage. Yeah. And that was like the start of the end of that tour. I don't know what it's, I think it must be really hard if you have so much pressure on you as a GC rider and- Being French as well. It just, the thing is this, like it can just disappear so quickly, one bad day and you just can't get it back. You know, it's, it must be horrible. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine the pressure of it. I mean, we you look at what's been on the men's side go. of the sport, what's been so fascinating is how Yeah, he does not look happy. So everybody <laughs> was interviewing him and I didn't care to interview him. So I was just standing behind him and got the photo as he turned away from the from the reporters. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. He <laughs> it, yeah, it's such a like I found with Pino, like I, I've grown to like him more. Yeah. As he's got older. And I think that is because he comes across that he really wears, he's very, he comes across as quite an emotional man. And it's actually really quite refreshing to see. Um, and then uh, Barde just is classy. He's, so sweet. he's such it's, a sweet guy and he's so classy. I know. It's like, yeah. I remember he turned up to one of the Red Hook crits. Oh my God, no way. <laughs> Yeah, he turned up to Red Hook Crit. Um, Roman Bardet. Yeah, just to watch. <laughs> Literally just to watch it. And Okay, at least he wasn't racing it, to be fair. No, he wasn't racing. He turned up to watch it. I think it was... My mate Owen told me about it. I think it was New York, I want to say. And Owen... Owen's like a massive cycling fan. Like He's a huge lover of the sport. He is now the chef for EF as well, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, or one of the chefs for EF. He's out at the Giro with them this, well, now, effectively. Yeah. Um, and um, he was like, yeah, I bumped into Roman Bardet at Red Hook. And I was like, are you serious? He's like, yeah, yeah, he was just coming and watching. He was just like, such a classy man and so polite. Mm -hmm. Just nice. so well-dressed. Yeah, I mean, super well-dressed. So. Yeah. And I mean, as you say, Pino and Bardet, the pressure they've had from the French media. I know. I think it's probably meant they have probably not achieved. I think the additional pressure that has been put on them is probably what stopped them achieving as well as they probably could yeah. have, if I'm honest with you. Yeah. And they are, you know, I, I just, I really would like one of them to do something really. I would love one of them to do something and just catch everyone off guard. and. I think Bardet moving to DSM is probably a really good move because it's just a bit of a fresh start for him. I mean, that team is always so good in Grand Tours too. So let's yeah. see. I mean, they've got him and Jai together at the Giro this year. So, which That's is also nice to have two people that the pressure is not just on one. So, and has Bardet ever done the Giro before? I don't think he has. I don't know. <laughs> probably not. Oh, I'm but, pretty sure he's only always done the Tour de France and not focused yeah. on the Giro or the Vuelta. So that's, you know, it could be very, yeah. you know, it could be a big weight off his shoulders, actually. Maybe he's not even going to go to the Tour. Who knows? Maybe he's focused on the Olympics. Good point. Good point. Mm -hmm. If it happens. Yeah. They're vaccinating people for it. <laughs> I mean, we could have a... Um, Swift Olympics now. Swift <laughs> Olympics. Well, I was just trying to think like who the current Olympic champions are. Are they going to be? Going um, if dude, if we have another four years with Greg Van Avermaet and fucking gold helmet, I am I'm done. Like seriously, I, at least Anna Van der Bregen has not been like milking that for five years. She, <laughs> the difference is she doesn't need to milk it. 
Okay, fair point. He does need to milk it. Like, like, dude, let it go. Maybe for like a year after it was okay, but come on, man. Like, I'm going to get in trouble. He's going to listen to this. He's going to be like, who is that bitch? <laughs> he, no, come on. Everybody thinks it. Let's, you know. Yeah, I mean... I mean, the Rio Olympics, that, I mean, that was pretty insane, that road race. And I don't think anyone expected either of them to win the men's or the women's race. They weren't the favourites no. by a long shot. So I kind of get why he's milked it a bit, but I do think he has maybe maybe gone a little bit too much of it. I mean, the, when, when he was at CCC and he had a gold giant, that was probably the, the bit of what, that's where I was like, just looks a bit oh, he's still going <laughs> like... yeah. the B, at least the bmc now looks quite classy because it's white with a bit of gold on it the yeah the it, when he when he was at when it was ccc and it was a gold a bright it was a proper gold giant whatever and the gold helmet and the gold glasses and the gold shoes uh, it's just like i don't know it's yeah yeah it was a bit much wasn't it but we i mean van der Bregen just like I know she just seems like the classiest. Well, she's got world championship stripes now. They kind of trump Olympic Olympic colors, don't they? She's, what has she not got stripes for? European, world, national, I think. Sure, at some point. Probably got national at some point. But to be fair, to be national champion, uh, uh, to be a national champion of the Netherlands, you it's pretty much like being a world champion anyway, world isn't it? Champion, yeah. It might be harder because you're actually racing against all those other people that are on your team for worlds. So yeah, yeah, yeah. curious to know if the Dutch girls think that nationals are harder than worlds. <laughs> I, I yeah, I, it's got to be, hasn't it? It's got to be. It's but crazy how strong the you know the Dutch um, the Dutch teams are. Full stop. I mean, it, men's and women's fields definitely, but the women's Dutch riders is insane. Like. Insane, isn't it? Yeah, and like you, anyway, going back to the other thing that you mentioned there briefly was talking about women's races. And that's something I was really keen to talk about with you anyway. And the re for your reference, and pretty much anyone who ever listens to these podcasts know, I don't script anything, I just freestyle it and let the conversation go because I think it's much nicer. And that's always been my stance because there is much of a thing for me to have a conversation with someone is really nice and then i always wanted to do it so that it was like people just listening into conversations and then yeah. it seems people seem to like it there's oh postman there's like 40 something episodes now so it seems to be going all right um people yeah. are listening. sorry to anybody that i'm that we're horribly boring for you right now <laughs> and they can turn off yeah <laughs> uh, so yeah, women's racing. I hands down thinks that women's bike racing is better to watch than men's. Yeah. I don't. I, I I do not care what people say on that. It's way more unpredictable. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a little asterisk to this. I think mm -hmm. both men's and women's racing over the last year or COVID period has been so much more unpredictable because it feels like every single race everyone's going there and going i don't know when i'm going to race next so i'm going to go for it which is also a little bit insane though <laughs> so i think yeah um women's racing has been so the races tend to be shorter um they they're a bit more dynamic i think recent i think one of the things that's happened with men's racing as well is that you have where the, the, it's like the generation of super freaks like I don't know who these guys are mm. like, but they're winning everything, everything. Yeah. And then as well, because so many of the men's races of the smaller races are getting canceled, you're not getting, these guys are entering everything. So like, what is Wout Van Aert doing at Trano trying to like do a good GC? It's because they don't have like the other prep races that they might have for something else because all of those have been canceled. So you're getting these Tour de France star lists. Like, what was it? Like a 12 Assange? Like, what the fuck was that? Yeah, that was weird, wasn't it? <laughs> so this is, so then the only downside of that for the men is that I actually think some of the smaller riders aren't getting the same opportunities. Like you have teams like EF that are actually only doing a world tour program this year. And yeah. so some of the smaller riders don't get the same opportunities um, that they would. And you have all these really strong guys showing up. So it does 
feel a bit scripted when you have these big teams and these big players that are targeting absolutely everything. Um, even with things like without having like the tour down under this year, where you always get like some crazy, you know, Richie always wins on Walunga, but like the stages can be kind of. Did it uh, the last one though, did he? I know. Well, this is, I'm not sure that counted, but, um, yeah. you know, but like, you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah. really unpredictable. It's really different. It's people are, you know, a lot of European guys are not, targeting tour down under so there's a bunch of opportunities there that stuff hasn't happened this year the women's race is definitely i mean you your top five the top five even maybe up to top 10 they can be they tend to be sort of it's very clear who those girls are yeah but the road scene and the dynamic of it is so much more interesting if that makes sense yeah it feels what i've always thought with the women's racing and especially ones i've watched recently like you you can't there's obviously there's a certain few riders you can't look past like yeah. we all know that the majority of those few riders are dutch as well ironically um there obviously are a few exceptions to that and and i think you can look at say for example sd works as a team and go that team is insane on everything about that team on paper is ridiculous and it was in its previous iteration, it was pretty similar, to be fair. They were just a super, super strong team. Um, but you look across all of the women's teams, and especially like when we look at Van Vluten going to Movistar, that's really up that team. And yeah. I can't think of the, the women's And Emma team. there as well. With yeah, her. that's it. Who are, yeah. And yeah. she's just come kind of, we've all, everyone's kind of known about her, but she's proper come like stepped up the mark this year. I had coffee with her yesterday morning, actually. I was like, finally, because, oh man. I mean, and the thing about Emma, I have to say, and everybody everybody should be a fan of Emma. Like she's 22 years old, right? Yeah. So, so many riders, if they had that spring, they would be so frustrated. Like she won every bunch sprint when somebody was solo ahead of yeah. her. And then every finish that was like a bunch sprint, she was second. Yeah. Like, but she was not stressed. She was just like laughing about it. She was more determined. And if you look at that first sprint stage in Elsie, I, I was like, Emma, I'm not even sure that was a sprint. That may have been a solo attack because you won by like a kilometer. <laughs> like, yeah. And she has, you know, she's got a super healthy attitude. She's, you know, she's, she's just strong. She's happy. She's well supported. And it's actually, it's, it's a great example. She's going, going to be one to watch for like the next 10 years for sure like she's 22 I, so i mean what was yeah. i doing at 22 i was at the pub i was <laughs> probably hanging out with bike messengers or something you know i was riding my fixed gear around town thinking i was cool so. i would have been working in architecture sitting at a desk probably for 20 hours a day so you're making money <laughs> you say that compared to the compared to the hours that you work not making money <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, like she's there's you know, and Movistar seem to have like their women's team is is really strong. Um, yeah. And then we've had like obviously you can't really look past Trek Segafredo, also a super super strong team. Yeah. And I mean, all of the Trek Segafredo kit and the national champs jerseys just look so. It's glad. so funny because you can't. You're like, where's Trek? Because they're all in different jerseys like every race. It's so funny. It's like, yeah. yeah. And then. As we've already sort of said about SD Works, their just lineup is insane. And then, like when they when Ashley Milburn Passio went there as well, I was just like, oh, I know, man. I know. Oh, why are they making this team any stronger? Yeah, <laughs> and, I know. But then uh, there's always the odd outsiders. Like I mean, Mariana Voss uh, and the Yumbo Visma team. I Mariana Voss is like one of my favourite cyclists of all time. It's amazing it's yeah. for many people, to be perfectly honest, and. And I say that because of you look at how she has won almost everything in some way, shape or form from every single type of discipline of bike riding. And there's no one, men's or, wo or women's peloton currently, and probably for quite a long time, who's done that. Yeah. Did you, I'm sure you saw, but did you see, I don't know who it was, somebody sent out a tweet that was like, has anybody ever done everything that Wout Van Aert has done? Like name one cyclist that's ever been able to time trial and climb and sprint. And he, that person just got slammed. Like there was hundreds of responses that just said Mariana. 
Yeah. And it was it was so funny, I'll be honest. It was like, yeah. She's <laughs> like, still like she's still got like I think she's still got a good few years left in her as well. Like Yeah, for sure. She's incredible. I mean then and then of course there was also the example of somebody around flesh that tried to say that like Valverde held the record of wins and also just got slammed. Yeah. <laughs> but it is funny to see it's but it's actually really nice to see because I think more and more people it's not just like the three or four of us that are like hey don't forget it. it's more and more people that are actually going oh actually you're no Anna van der Breggen is the record holder for mm. most wins um of flesh like stop dismissing that and it's it's becoming more and more of a group of people that are saying not just a few of us like yeah it's nice to see um it, the popularity is definitely growing it's all yeah and like you said back to the the first part it's because the racing yeah it is really exciting like i watched women's amstel i didn't watch men's amstel I'll be honest. Yeah. like you know it just there's definitely you can't predict who's going to win it no. that that's like that i mean you could maybe predict it into i don't know a group of potentially 10 or 15 mm-hmm. but yeah. Like in comparison to some of the like men's races where you can go, ah, it's going to be one of these three. Like, and still you can't, I, I just think like there seems to be a lot more, almost, as you said, the women's races are shorter, but I, I think that makes it better quite a lot of the time. Much I think there's better. also something where they're racing. I don't want to say that it's raw talent, but like in a little way, it, it it, you could say that it is like clearly the difference in budget between SD works and like a smaller women's team is significant. Yeah. But when you look at the men's racing, you tend to have the guys from the super teams that are always on the podium and it's the money and everything that goes into it. And the difference between the budget of Ineos and the budget of Quebec Assos. Oh yeah is bigger right and that's why everybody at strata is like so stoked that michael gogol's in there right and they're just like this is awesome to see but i think the women's racing there's less differentiation like you really see the talent and it's just raw instinct and that's one of the reasons that it's so exciting it's not just these big machines of these teams that have been racing and riding the front and launching the guys off it's they're racing they race so hard yeah. And of course, having a strong team always helps because one of the things you see with women's races is so many attacks will go and then one will stick and you never know which one it is. And you need to be represented in most of them to have success like SD Works has, where SD Works goes into any race and goes, right, any four of you could win today. But it's, I mean, it's just so much more dynamic to watch. That's Yeah. It, there's um, completely, I mean, we look at, I saw something a while ago. I wonder if I can find it quickly. That was talking about uh, men's world tour team budgets, and it was it was actually a thing that I did for an old client, and it was breaking down the budgets. I think from twenty eighteen or something, and purely because there there hasn't been a lot of information like put out there for much more recently, and of course, going much more recently, those budgets are going to be tenfold again um and the gap between Ineos to as you say uh Quebec Assos or I think it was actually Movistar's budget isn't as big as a lot of people think it is uh you know when you start to see that kind of thing it's kind of like kind of like oh shit okay here we go so this is 2019 team budgets um and it's only Apparently, it's only uh, highlighting the men's teams. Yeah, some of the top and the bottom. <laughs> so top is Ineos, twenty-five million dollars. I'll do okay. the top, the top three and the bottom three. Okay. Uh, second is Astana with okay. fourteen, and yeah. third was CCC <laughs> well, okay. with twelve point five. Well, third yeah. joint third was CCC and uh, Quickstep, twelve point five million. Right, and then. In contrast, you go to the bottom end of it, Arkea Samsic, 2.5 million. The Total uh, Direct Energy, 4.25. And then Bahrain Merida, 5 million. 
and you know looking sort of middle middle park sunwebs on nine azure twos on 8.5 ef's 8.5 trex 8.5 but that the big the big headline thing is ineos being first on 25 million in 2019 Second I think place. it might even be more than that, to be honest. Like, it, I'm not. It'll be, more, it'll be more than that now, 100%. I think, but I think all, I think those numbers might all be actually even low, even at the bottom. But like, I think, but it's, yeah, it's crazy. That's such a difference, right? It's, oh, it's, it's, but then the thing that people don't think about as well is that once a team is, so like you use Movie Star as an example, and I think it's a really interesting example. You said actually Movie Star is on a lot less. This is actually one of the things that happened at Katusha. So, you know, I worked with them for a few years is that everybody assumed that Katusha was this massively budgeted team, mm -hmm. but it was, and then it kept getting cut and cut and cut and cut and cut over the years. And then they were one of the smallest budget teams, but nobody knew that everybody just assumed that it was like this massive budget team. Yeah, but it's so, because they've been going for And the so same long. thing will have been the case with Movie Star is at one point they will have been huge budget and then it's just sort of like it takes a little bit out every year. And you don't always get, especially when you have a sort of solo sponsored teams, you don't really know. Like, you know, Kofidis goes, oh, we'll up our budget by a million next year. And you're like, cool, you know, and, but it's, it changes so much and it changes based on the sponsor and yeah. What do you think is the solution to that, though? Because we keep seeing teams fall. I have, I have like a radically left solution, which Nathan, even Nathan was like, lovely idea, Laura, would never work, is I think every team should submit 20% of their budget into a pool, yeah. and then it all gets, that all gets divided evenly, like a nice bit of socialism. So, you know, I'm sure I'm going to lose a few followers off that. <laughs> but, I mean, the thing is that if you, look, if you think of it, like, very logically, it makes a lot of sense because... The problem we're having, and we have it every single year, and it, I think it was in fact accelerated massively last year, was the situation with teams folding. Katusha yeah. folded, what was that, a couple of years ago now? Yeah. Uh, and Katusha had been going for a long time. Like that was a very recognizable, the kit was so recognizable, massive K on the back of the jersey, and it always was that. And, you know, I, I mean, I can't even think how long Katusha was going, but you think that that team must have been 10 years at least. But it, it was, but to be honest, it was going longer, like the structure around it was going for longer than that. And it's these weird things that, I mean, to, that the a lot of the structure of Katusha was born out of US Postal, which just sounds yeah. bad, but he never dies. It just, you know. Rebranded. I mean, the thing is you say US Postal, well, guess what? Garmin had the U.S. Postal bus until like three years ago. The service course in Girona is the old U.S. Postal service course. So I know it sounds bad, right? But I don't. It should. I don't mean for it to sound bad like that. But like the staff. You mainly talking about when a team folds, what happens to the staff and where that goes, and who's and so the structure around, and not just the staff at races, but the staff and the other thirty people that work for a team that nobody ever sees or knows about that are working in the offices and running sponsorship and logistics and all this stuff, those structures tend to carry on through years mm. until a team really folds like Katusha did. And th they were all put out of work basically, which was a shame. So, mm. yeah. I mean, we had, it's like the ones that were, I mean, the big one that was of stress to follow was Quebec or Assos. Yeah. Cause yeah. you know, Doug Ryder has done such a, from an external perspective i don't personally yeah. know doug and i don't really know many people at the team um seeing what he had done with that team from mtn quebec days yeah. to then as we go ended up merging into dimension data and then ntt and now quebec rassos it felt like the dimension data days were like it felt like that was kind of like the peak days of it of you know? like results cav and yeah. eddie and steve cummings and they were so cool and they had Scott doing their photos and yeah. That's when it felt like it was kind of at its peak, you know, as you say, Cav was winning stages. You had Boston Hagen there. You had uh, Bernie Eisel there, Mark Renshaw. Like it felt like a real yeah. proper, really cool, like it was my favorite team back then, hands yeah. down. Yeah, everybody loved them. They were the underdogs. Yeah. And, yeah. Steve Cummings winning on Mandela Day, like that was that was incredible. And then it felt like things kind of tailed off a bit, unfortunately. But the fact that that and then it was that point, wasn't it? Like last year, when the riders didn't know they were going to have a contract, and we saw you know some of the bigger riders in the team, Ben O'Connor, for example, shifting over, like 
And there was definitely, I think there, it felt like there was a genuine concern that that team was going to fold. It, I, I honestly, I, I, I work with Doug really close. I have for years. We run the, until COVID killed it, but we were running the Girona Gala for Quebec long after Nathan wasn't on the team anymore, even. Yeah. Um, and like we're, you know, both Nathan and I are really committed to supporting Quebec and support, I do all their headshots for them every year. And so, you know, the, that team has always been family to me and they always will be. Um, I think there was actually genuine concern. I don't think it was riders jumping ship um, to some degree as well. I think everybody does take an opportunity. Ben had been there since he was in Neo Pro, And I think it's yeah. really important for riders to step away sometimes yeah. to try to move on. You do have some riders like Alex Howes will, his entire career will have been at one team, will have been a Gar- Garmin from when it was like a development team, basically, yeah. until, and that is, I mean, there's a few riders that have that, but I think a lot of riders, they do need to step away to progress and sort of, you know, when you come in and you're a baby, it's hard to not always be the baby. Yes, you know, exactly. Here. So I, mean, I think for a lot of them, it was quite hard. Like I know Ben King, I think was really upset to leave, but they, you know, I, what do you want me to say? If Nathan was in that position, I would have told him to leave if somebody else was offering him a job. Cause it's like, yeah. you know, if it folds in, in January and December and you don't have another offer, you're not getting one. Like it's horribly cutthroat, but I think they'll come back together. I think it was, I think it was really tough for them because they also lost a lot of in for that team in the few years, they lost a lot of those personalities. And it's sort of funny because we go back and say, Oh, like, this is why we love Bardet and Pino. And that's what also we loved about, that team like you want to talk about classy guys cav is one of the classiest bike riders we will ever have you mm. know and anybody that wants to call him an asshole like get through me first you know like and you lost they lost a lot of those riders because of the changes in sponsorship because of the changes in direction because sponsors sometimes dictate what they want to see with the team mm. i think it's great to see where they are now because i think that doug has kind of refocused it and now he gets to sort of direct it again. They're the under, then they've gone back to being these underdogs and they're, they're smashing it. You know, they're getting good results for where they are and yeah. in the budget and yeah. They, it's, it's, so, it's so much nicer to see. It feels like there's been a real breath of fresh air there. And, you know, the, when it was Dimension Data, that felt like it was a really good time. And then the NTT thing all felt a bit weird. And that I, that, I know that all came around because NTT bought Dimension Data yeah. basically. Right. Um, but it all felt very weird and a bit segregated and a bit separate. And I, personally, I just didn't like the kit. I'll be, pe- I'll be blunt. It's all about the kit, isn't it? <laughs> I'd be blunt. I thought it was boring. Um, and then, you know, seeing, like, I, I'm good friends with the guys from Aero Coach, and I know the guys at Hunt Wheels really well as well. And I, you know, they they sort of saw the that it was an opportunity to help out in a way that would be good for everyone involved like Faro coach it's you know it's about having the riders using their extensions and stuff on the tt bikes which is really a great exposure for a tiny company and similarly for hunt you know people have a perception that hunt is a massive brand and really really not a huge brand i mean they're like three kids from yorkshire i swear they're all 12 i'm sorry uh, they're, uh, sorry Ali. <laughs> they uh you know they i mean i remember when they started like i used to ride with there's three brothers and a dad and i used to ride with one of the bro- brothers quite a lot whose yeah. nickname is shouty um because he's very loud um, okay and basically it's you know it's a small family run business and it's slowly grown and grown and grown and admittedly yes they are a lot bigger than they were like five, 10 years ago, but they're still a small company, like yeah. both AeroCoach and Hunt, they're both small companies still. And to, for them, the exposure at world tour level is like incredible because it kind of validates them a bit as a brand, but also the flip side, they saw the opportunity of going to Quebec or Assos and being able to offer something to the team. There's a smaller team, which isn't necessarily, you know, financial input, but it's, providing something which things that are very fundamental for the team that they're going to need anyway um but, you know, and it's I, interesting because i think so many people in that time were sort of asking what they could do to help yeah and i've had the and this is the thing is that i sort of say the same thing about when you know with the with the recent cases with the um 
oh my god, well, Van Gansen. I'm like, oh, those guys. Which, which one was it? With Van Gansen case uh, and the the verdict of you know a two year suspension and people saying, oh, oh, this isn't this isn't good. This isn't good enough. And what can we do as people? Well, we can all. It's what they say is like you vote with your wallet. Yeah. And it's the same case in this. It's like people go, oh, we want to donate to Quebec assets. We want to put in. We want to have a fan thing for the team. Well, it's never going to work and it's never going to be sustainable. But if you love Quebeca Assos, go buy a set of Hunt wheels or go buy an Assos jersey or go buy a BMC bike or support any of the people that are supporting them. And when you make that order, if you make it online, put a note in the order that says, I actually bought this because of your support for the, my favorite team. Yeah, and it makes- and That little thing, that goes so long because when the marketing company sees that and the, or they get that passed on, they go, right, our sponsorship is working because- People are actually buying this. And in the same thing with Van Gensing, like, guess what? Don't support any of the companies that sponsor any of his teams in the future. Like, you don't want that man involved in sport. Make mm-hmm. sure that the women that he's trying to sign have better opportunities and they're well-informed and they don't go to that team and don't sub- and call the sponsors and say, we're not going to, we're going to boycott your company if you work with this guy. Like, we do have the power as fans yeah. across the board and we all need to remember that. So, like, if you love the team, support it. <laughs> that's simple it is really simple and i mean that goes down to in the simplest way and shape or form that i can think of is buy the team jersey like exactly which, there's this percent i mean in the uk 100 percent. there's this thing about like oh, oh, pro oh, kit wankers pro so. kit wanker and all that which is <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. like i've got freaking old team sky jerseys that i have them because i just thought they were fucking cool like i've got two or three old sky jerseys and dimension data jerseys like just because and it, to be honest it's not necessarily that i'm going to wear them is i just really like them as well yeah um and but if i want to wear them there's no reason why i can't like i hate that whole like protein wanker thing is just bullshit like i think the new jersey that assos did is really good the the mm-hmm. sort of collaboration one yeah yeah this and there's there's that's a nice blend you know you yeah. must be like oh, a team supporter but not you know but you, yeah. you see that, that a lot of the teams are trying to engage so much more in this opportunity and understanding that they, that's a good way to work with your fans. And that what they're doing is not just offering the race team jersey. I think I saw, uh, you know, the, as you say, the, the Quebec Rassos one with the big hand on it. That's a, yeah. that's a really lovely jersey. And it looks yeah. super, super slick and super smart. Yeah. Katusha did it by doing... Having a whole brand built around it. Having a brand around it and, yeah. you know training style jerseys that were still following the race the cut and everything in the race yeah. team you look at the likes of um i mean everyone's going to talk about ef with their crazy duck stuff and everything which is great because it that you talk about what ef did at the zero in 2020 that got more press than anything else no but yeah I, I still get so frustrated because i'm like duh <laughs> like, you know i'm like it's well, so simple will- well, that worked well. And like, I swear, JB is probably going to like, you know, if he loses, he's going to be like, fucking Marsh. <laughs> but like, I, I want to be very clear about something. And I will tell your entire audience that I don't care. There is a reason. And everybody knows that any kit change that has to be done through the UCI. Yeah. And JB knows that. And he purposely didn't do it to make a deal. Be, oh, we got fined. It's like, you got fined because you didn't tell them on purpose. So you could like complain about not getting fined. Come on. <laughs> you know, it- it was like, a, but it worked it's marketing it was, and it worked it was so, brilliant yeah. marketing and it, yep. I mean, it was brilliant marketing because it went outside of cycling yeah it took the sport in a position outside of just being fo- people focused looking in on cycling and that 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 is in my mind is one of the ways where cycling needs to evolve a bit more is figuring out what these unique things are which take the eyes that are not looking at cycling and force them to look at it again. But like, think back to, was it what year? Well, I want to say 2012, 20, when was specialized Lululemon? I'm going to look Google because their kit was amazing. Yeah. And that was the same thing. It was so long ago though. Um, and that was, I think that was one of the first examples of like, you know, and you go back to like rock racing, although that stuff was horrible, <laughs> but there, there, it has been around for a long time. This sort of, you know, they, the Lululemon specialized was. Lululemon definitely broke the mold. Yeah, a long time ago with that, and unfortunately, may have just been. Oh, look here, here's the kit. It's just for sale on eBay, though. Um, that was 2012. 
2012. So um, and unfortunately, maybe it was just ahead of its time for women's stuff. But, yeah. you know, people were paying attention at that point. But they were then and rock racing, I think, were the first to sort of break the mold on that. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it's not, as you say, it's not a new thing. It's something that's been going on for a while. It's just that it was how Jonathan Waters and the team talked about it. I know. <laughs> that was what ha- helped add and yeah. the story to like escalate and everything like that. And, and you sort of wonder what's going to come next. And I mean, the one, the team that I'm really watching for this sort of stuff is actually Legion. Yeah. Uh, which I just think is like, I just think is the raddest team out there. Like, I'm like, I want to work for them. <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. It, it, uh, that team, what feels nice about that team is it does, it's nice how it's just, it's nice that it felt like it was kind of trickling under the woodworks a bit. And then it was like, bam, let's get, we've actually yeah. got a, it's got serious again and they all I, I've, I've not spoken or met any of them i'll be honest but they all just seem you gotta like, get some, you gotta get them on the podcast for sure <laughs> i would love to anyone from that yeah. team because it right. seems like a really good bunch of people well we'll just put that in the notes and then we'll talk about that when we're sharing this podcast and then i'll we'll sort it we'll get you know because they've just hired reed to do their finances and freddie so we'll just work with them we'll get <laughs> it's it's just like Anything that is, in my opinion, with cycling, men's and women's side of the sport, anything which is that attracts the attention of the fans and is accessible and slightly different from the old school mentality is a positive. And what I mean, I think it's either. I, 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 I don't. It is like those girls are going to be so happy racing and getting paid to race without yeah. you know and they're going to do well and it doesn't have to it doesn't fit in this box like pro cycling is so old school yeah exactly i, I think this is just the few i am so excited to see what where they go and what they do and it's already so cool so like freddie of it he's here in girona there's no races here but he is like i mean he's killing it on zwift right and he's so good at it and he signed for the team to race on the road but for now He's racing on Zwift and he's racing gravel and Specialized love it. And Specialized is so stoked to have somebody doing gravel races in Girona. So he's mm. getting pulling that whole side in. I mean, it's the future. I also see it a bit actually with Alpus and Phoenix, which hilariously, you know, you got all of the insider insider tips. Apparently that is like the hot team. Like every rider wants to go to Alpus yeah. and Phoenix. Um, but if you look on their website, it says road team, mountain bike team, gravel team, like, and then they have, Planter Pura, I'm like, what's it called? The women's team, which is basically also part of it. And all of those girls are cyclocross riders, yeah. but then they're in the floor of Flanders. And uh, it's like this sort of multidisciplinary thing, which is going to give so much more value for sponsors, give fans so many more levels of engagement. Mm-hmm. And it will help riders sort of also have more balance. So Vanderpool wants to race some stuff on the road. He wants to race some cyclocross. He wants to race some mountain bike. Well, now he's not trying to do it for like separate teams. Mm. It's all there under one one umbrella for him and the same for the girls that are racing cross and road and i i think it's yeah and when you start to put men's and women's together as well you stop having that issue about yeah. is women cycling equal when they have the same sponsors so completely agree completely agree and and how we're starting to see more teams accepting that they should have a men's and a women's team yeah it, it just makes so much more sense and i know that um, part of the, I know from my dealings with Cervelo, I know that part of the agreement of them going to Yambo Visma was that a women's team had to be set up. And that's because Cervelo's always insisted that they sponsor a men's and a women's team. Right. Yeah. From going, it doesn't have to be that it's the same. Uh, yeah. But they, always, they had, they were with Big Love for so long. And then, yeah. yeah. So they've always insisted there's a men's and a women's team. Yeah. And so seeing, you know, when I was talking to those guys, they were like, yeah, we, we put a bit of pressure on them. Like, Yum, to be fair, Yumbo Visma wanted to do it anyway. Like it was kind of, they were probably planning on doing it a year earlier, but hadn't quite figured it out on paper. But that was the additional pressure that, you know, Cervelo turned around and said like, well, if you want our bikes under your team, there needs to be a women's team as well. Because it just makes it so much more, as you say, having the same sponsors, same kit, everything like that. It's just so much more time. Emma was telling me yesterday how nice it was to be at the classics and like have a chef there and a yeah. chef like 
like the whole like setup, like they have like a meal truck or whatever. Yeah. Um, for them, I mean, it's they never had that before, right? Like women's teams don't. I well, Canyon Stram has like a chef person, but most generally, no. <laughs> so like they, so, you know, for the girls, it, it offers so much, but then for the organization overall it's saving money if you have like, if you're in one hotel and you can share the resources, so. It does feel like the Movistar team really has like embedded that, that the teams are training together and they're traveling together and working together. And it, yep. it, it seems very- And Trek as well. Actually. Yeah, Trek as well. Uh, or Amy, I don't know if you've ever met Amy, the PR girl, she was with CCC and now she's with Trek. I mean, they, I mean, this also makes sense. They all, they do it under one channel, but for some of the Ardennes, she was, for men, she was there for the men's and women's race, and the women's races started so early. Yes, she was like at flesh for like fourteen hours or something, you know. Such a long day, <laughs> really long day for her. You sort of think she's like, I don't know, I, I that that's a whole other conversation is why they're starting women's races at eight thirty in the morning, but you know. Yeah, what was it? What was the when was it when? Uh... I can't remember what race it was, but the women's race caught up with the men's race and they had to slow yeah. the women's race. So I remember that. I can't remember which race it was either, but it was not good. It was like a couple of years ago, wasn't it? And yeah. it was just like, I remember just thinking, just tell the men to fucking stop and, stop, right. yeah, and get out of the way and let the women's race carry on because if they're just yeah. dicking around riding slowly, yeah. The, the camera should be focused on what's happening on a race where it's attacking and is hyper interesting right now. And, and it's sort of interesting because one of the reasons they do start early and it's it's one of those things that it does get, it's the same thing where people sort of complain about it and you go, okay, so here's actually why, sorry guys, but like, do you know how expensive it is per camera, per cameraman? So like, yeah, you can have, you could have women's flesh start at 11 and finish at three and mm -hmm. men start at the same time and finish at four, like whatever you could have it. Cause they start from different places. They won't hit each other, mm -hmm. but then you're only going to have, you're not going to have them filming the women's finish because exactly. there's only one, there's one helicopter or plane in the sky. There's one, there's one live relay going at a time. So people don't realize that with the pro like pro races, it's not actually, and I, I only, I think I only got, a, was made aware of this when I went to the Tour de France in 2019, is obviously there's the discussion of how many cameras there are on the road, on bikes and stuff. Then you've got to remember there's, from those cameras, there's one helicopter which is taking that signal and then another helicopter which is transponding that to wherever that's. And then a plane. And a plane. <laughs> and a plane flying around broadcasting it. It's yeah. like. And. Yeah. Then you've got the helicopters that are flying with the cameras on for the aerial shots. And then yeah. in the Tour de France, I think there's like three or four of them. Oh yeah, it's mental, yeah. And bear in mind that a helicopter can only be in the air for a certain amount of time. It's not a huge amount of time. So yeah. you then need multiple helicopters for each one of those positions because I think they're limited to like an hour or two or something like that in the air. Yeah. It's not a lot. So yeah, then you're talking so say, for example, you start off with like having nine helicopters. Realistically, you potentially need 30 helicopters for one stage. And that, that's, that's the Tour de France. I mean, that's the, the kind of the pinnacle of it. But even in the smaller races, it's still going to be like five or six helicopters and the plane to be able to do all of that and broadcast the signals and broadcast it out to everyone. So yeah. it is a logistical nightmare. So it's everything has its advantages or disadvantages, doesn't it? So like when men's and women's race, you want to put them on the same day so you get the same crowds and and the attention is there. Like I think what um, Flanders Classics does is great. Like I bet the women's race was after was yeah. a really good solution. Of course, there's always going to be something. So people still say, oh, they only showed the last hour of the race. It's like, well, it's better than none. <laughs> do you would you rather start at 8 a.m like i don't know it's sort of like it's it's always going to be something when you're trying to balance two broadcasts and like in the same way until we all start showing people where the, showing them where the money is and where the value is it won't change so what can you do you just I, this is what i always say is just turn on eurosport and leave it playing on the background for any women's race just so they go oh the value is there because people are watching it it's so simple yeah. to do stuff but it's you know there is always going to be a balance and then you could say okay that sucked because we all 
didn't have dinner until 10 p.m. after Flanders because the race ended at 6.30. Well, it's always something, right? So, mm -hmm. Although these Basque races next week, I'm laughing because they start at 3.30 p.m. And I'm like, this is the most Basque thing ever. So That's because everyone's had the siesta beforehand. Yeah. After, after nap time, yeah. So, What do you think of, um, I saw the rescheduled uh, Roubaix. They're doing the men's race on one day and the women's race on a separate day, aren't they? might be better for that just to give because i think both of those will be fully televised so i yeah. agree i think because of the fact that it will be the first women's roubaix as well there's going to be so much focus on that yeah. but everyone wants to win that race the oh, i know I and know. to be the first winner of it i mean it'd be incredible and it's i feel like it's almost the, the pressure of it has built up because it's now been delayed what well, realistically three times so many times right yeah. it's just like i know and i'm so glad that it is happening because i never really understood why it wasn't and you know it, it, for me Roubaix was like, yeah i think i'm not one of the only people that thinks that i think a lot of people probably were in the same mindset and i remember specialized did a like a video of it about it and under, like talking about why it wasn't happening and for you know there's no reason why it shouldn't it is there's just it shouldn't have ever been a discussion point and the fact that it is and you know it got confirmed and it, it's got built up and up and up and now now i think it's at that point of i know it, everyone's it almost, three times it's yeah. like it almost feels like it's jinxed in a weird way i know but I mean, say that. yeah, fingers crossed. Like, I mean, I really do have my fingers crossed that that one does happen because, oh man, it'll be, it's going to be incredible. Like the women, I think the women's edition will be probably is going to be better to watch than the men's. And I, yeah. what I mean on that is, as we've already sort of discussed about, you literally can't predict it. There's maybe, no. 10, maybe 10 riders that you could go, maybe this person, but you, there's so many outside bets on that one. And I don't think you tend to get that so much in the men's race. I can't well, if think. Who's going to hold form until October? What's going to happen? Who knows? Like, you know, in the classic, for the girls as well. Like, and if you think about it, the girls haven't had any stage races yet, basically. <laughs> like there's yeah. a little thing here or there, right? Or Elsie Jacobs, do you count that? It's prologue in two stages. But, um, you know, they now start sort of more for them, the, the stage racing season. Yeah. So to take... Roubaix and then throw it back in October is sort of like what's going to happen because you just don't know you know and one of the reasons that I think that you see Anna and Anamique do so well is that they're very Anna and Anamique are both riders that do very well at targeting certain races and so they don't as well having teams that they can say that you know Anamique can go right so this one's for Emma like you know, I'm out. And the same thing for Anna having a team that she can, you know, you saw her celebrate Demi Voller the other day. Like, you know, she, Anna said flesh that was she, you know, and she's good all the time, but is she truly targeting all of them? Can she take a rest at some of them? Is she trying to win Dwarves, Doris Flander? And probably not like she's going, right. these are the ones I want to. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens when you take Roubaix and separate it out of that classic season is everybody going to be absolutely pinging for like this one, one day race? Like, is it going to be the world championships again? I think it could be. And the world championships is a week later, I think. Right, exactly. And it's also there. So it's basically the same road. So it's going to yeah. be, I mean, yeah, it's Belgian, isn't it? It's just going to be that period is going to be insane. It's like, I read uh, a tweet that Luke Rowe put out talking about, the, he was wrecking the world champs course and he just wrote something like just wrecked the world champs course it is absolutely brutal it would be amazing <laughs> to watch that is pretty much it yeah um, and it, apparently it's like flanders on crack apparently they've just said yeah but but the first half is like flanders on crack and then it's like an ardennes yeah so it's actually really interesting because nathan's favorite races are the ardennes right like and he hates the cobbles <laughs> so I mean, he's on the list for Australia at this point, but he's like, oh, I was going to get through the first half. <laughs> because, I mean, in the women's peloton, those, like, all the riders tend to do are Dens and Cobble Classic. Men's are, are a handful of people that will do both. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's going to be, it's going to be so interesting to see the dynamic between the two halves. And, like, because of that, as opposed to, like, the sort of race where they go, 
okay, so like, let's let a break go for the first half of it. Are the classics writers going to try to use the first half to shake all the gu smaller guys to survive the second? Like, I think it's going to be so interesting. And my response was, well, maybe they should just like make it a relay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to mix it up. Two winners, two man teams, yeah. <laughs> World champs to a relay. That'd be, I'd watch it. I mean, look, to be honest, controversial opinion. I think that the world championship should be a three day race and it should be the overall winner from it. But I think it's so random. Like I actually love the women's leaders Jersey. Yeah. For the, and I wish they had that for men. Yeah. It's I don't know why a, they don't. It makes so much sense, doesn't it? I just, and it, Cause if you like, you know, if somebody starts in Australia, like Richie would have it at first and then Trek would get to be like, we have the leader, not that the Trek doesn't have enough world champions from the North, but you know, um, national champions, all of them. But then they would have something to talk about. It always helps with marketing just to have something like that. I don't know why they don't. Yeah, um, I don't think, I completely agree. Like it, it feels weird that it isn't in the men's peloton when it is in the women's as well. Yeah. And it, as you say, it's nice because it gives, it's a, becomes a special jersey, like, for riders to target and aim for and and it i just think it adds as you say it becomes a great marketing thing it adds a bit more to some of the smaller races as well yep. like it adds and they a, used to have it i mean dare i say you're gonna be like oh my god i remember like it must have been 2012 <laughs> i want to say that john tiernan Locke had the european leaders jersey yeah so they used to have it. Dare I say that? Dare I say that name aloud? Um, but um, Me, yeah, say that one under your breath. That name. But that it's disappeared. I don't remember. I mean, and I think Nathan, at one point, he would have won had an Oceana's leaders jersey back in the day, a long time ago. But they should be back. They didn't occur. I mean, because the thing is, world championships and national championships, all of that. It's it's a one day race. It can be really arbitrary, right? Like. <laughs> I mean, I think we all would have been surprised if Trenton had been world champion, for instance. So, <laughs> and you do get these, you, you get these sort of random ones that you're like, okay, I always think like, you know, there should be something else to balance. It is what it is. It's a one day race, but why not have like a constant leader's jersey? Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. And when you say about like Trenton being world champion, that would have been a, there's no denying he's an incredibly talented bike rider, but I think it would have been one that people would have been a bit like, Oh, yep. And and, and I mean, then, Mads Pedersen, another example. No one expects him yeah, to win. Nobody like, expected him to win. He but. and what's so sad is that he hardly got to wear the jersey. Really, I know, I know. I'm uh, just checking the rankings. Oh, look, it's broken on the UCI. So let's try to reload that. <laughs> nope. Data ride dot UCI refused to connect. Well, it won't tell me the rankings, but you could all, you know, you yeah. It rewards people that race more, it rewards strong rides. It's, yeah. It's definitely a, a thing that could, I don't know, how do we make it happen? I don't know. I think pro cycling stats should be allowed to have one from theirs as well. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. And yeah, I, I, I completely agree with you on that topic. It's such a, it's a cool thing in the women's pattern. And I also really like that it has, the jerseys changed hands quite a lot over the yeah. last you know it, this season already and we're what what we in may and it feels like the jersey's been on the shoulders of what like four or five different riders i would say yeah i Which mean is, they keep going back and forth between this but then the the young riders jersey as well is nice to sort of encourage development although granted i mean i think for the men's racing at least there should no longer be a young riders jersey there should be an old riders jersey because the young riders are winning everything it should definitely be the silver jersey for like best placed over 30 yeah. <laughs> so. you or, or is it a case that they lower the age of the young riders category possibly but i still think a silver jersey for the old fuckers would be fucking amazing yeah. <laughs> like, who's the wiliest fox out there yeah and then you get like or maybe you push it up to like 35 and like gripe will get something you know <laughs> so. yeah. yeah i mean how many riders are there it, i mean in the women's peloton there's definitely there is quite a large proportion of older, I say older, it's still not old, but older riders in the women's peloton. In the men's peloton, plus 35, there's, I, there aren't a huge amount. Not plus, yeah, it's, I don't, it's been a game plus of the that, young right now. Plus 35, specifically, I'm saying, like, there's not a huge amount plus that. As you mm -hmm. say, Greipel, Cav, is he 35? 
Valverde. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, he's his own category for many reasons. There uh, are a pile. I mean, how old's been Evermart? I don't think he's as old as people think. Oh, he's just been around for ages, it feels like. Gilbert. Then, Gilbert, yeah, it's another example. Um, God, there's, I can't, there's not, there, but there's not a huge amount that you can think of, really. Mm. Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head, really. I'm trying to think now. I'm like busting my brain. I don't even know. I think I there's some other truth in the fact that we're at a time period right now that if you are over 35 male pro cyclist you were most likely on a team when you were 19 or 20 that could have been had more systematic doping in it Hmm. so you know if you're one of those really young guys like maybe you were in and then you were out really quickly like there's a weird there's a weird age gap where there's a few guys that are in their late 30s that were definitely still they were around when that was still the norm yeah and then there's a bit of a gap of a few years and then there's some younger guys and so it's either the case i'm not gonna get in trouble for like slender or anything where like there were guys that were in teams that were doing this and they have a performance benefit because from their first days and can you i look i not my business to blame anybody especially when every team is doing it it's like okay so that's what was happening it wasn't right but guess what well, everyone was doing but it. it is like yeah so and maybe they still have a performance benefit so they're still going later into their career not mm-hmm. i'm not accusing anybody of doing anything now but then you have this gap of like the guys that came right after that that maybe they're just 35 and they're too old <laughs> so yeah no you're completely right and and yeah. i mean the thing is on the subject of doping is that it's what almost frustrates me somewhat about it is that it's always brought up in terms of cycling Mm. but it is rife in other sports i know like this is what a lot of people don't realize and i mean i've heard stories from people that work in journalism of other sports uh i'm not necessarily going to say what the sports are or anything like that but i think it's pretty obvious if you uh follow what are the big sports globally and say the biggest sport probably in the uk but there's a lot of stuff which just doesn't quite add up um Mm -hmm. to turn with physique of certain uh men and recovery Mm -hmm. rates and that kind of thing um and i mean stuff has come out about like steroid injections to cover up uh, injuries and things like that uh, but yeah I, and I, i've heard from uh, friends who are journalists in other sports that the reason why it hasn't come up is because of how much that sport is valuable to said newspaper magazine whatever it is Not me overall and it won't come out until someone comes out about it and kind of goes fuck it i'm gonna bust the gut on this and put it out there unfortunately uh and speaking of I... unnamed other sports have you seen ted lasso the tv show no go on you should, you should. it's no. on apple tv write it down <laughs> it'll it'll make you want to be involved in every you know we're not going to say what sport it's about but i'm pretty sure time about the same one so <laughs> yeah i know this i know the one. I, I was trying to think with the the guy who's in it but i know who it is it's 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 bloody brilliant everybody watch it it makes you it was, it's how cycling should be run. Yeah, so. that is a series. I've, I've seen it on Apple TV, but I haven't watched it. As in it's come up. You'll watch, it. You'll watch it all in one night and tell people. I'm currently doing, in the UK, the big one at the moment has been uh, uh, Line of Duty. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Is it good? I, I started watching it about three weeks ago from series one. I've nearly finished. Okay. It's very good. How many good. series are there? Six. Okay, so it is good. <laughs> okay. I would... I, I I don't know. I won't give anything away uh, to any to you or anyone. But I I'm about halfway through series six, and shit's going down basically. Like perfect timing because you're almost out, and then you can watch Ted Lasso. Yeah, I need a new Ted series. Lasso to come coach a cycling team for like a week or two. Yeah, that'd be a good, a good solution. You gotta, I mean, it would be brilliant. So I think um, yeah, I mean. I'm nearly finished with it and I would I would recommend it. It's not normally the kind of series I would watch. Mm, is it scary? And, uh it's all about like crime in the UK, basically. There's okay. murders and 
uh, drug stuff going on. But part of it for me is that what's really stupid is that serious dramas like that, because it is quite serious and the kind of topics it does discuss at points are incredibly serious, in fact. Um, but I somehow seem to find something amusing about every character in it. <laughs> which I shouldn't do. But there's something about every single character that ends up being right. something that I can't stop but sort of chuckle about. Right. And is it like, oh, I know somebody that's just like that sort of thing? Well, one, of the, the main, one of the main guys is like a really small man who always wears waistcoats. And he's like, oh, mate, he's like a proper like East London. Right. We all know somebody like that, don't yeah. we? Yeah. I used to go to, yeah. I went to uni with someone that is, just reminds me exactly of him. And then, like, one of the other main guys is, like, Irish, and I'm not sure if he's Irish or Northern Irish, but he's got a very thick accent and is quite religious and uh, also a Mason. So all of that's quite interesting as a dynamic. Okay, I'll open my mind so we can watch it together. So. Yeah. Uh, so I would recommend watching it differently. Uh, it's probably... My greatest lockdown achievement was re-watching all of Seinfeld, so... <laughs> <laughs> the thing is... That's where it's lockdowns, so good. yeah. Lockdowns worked out good for things like that, hasn't it? It's still so good. I wasn't sure because I was a little bit young when it first came out. That I didn't really get it. Like my parents watched it, and I was like, like I knew the characters, and I thought that Kramer was really funny, but I didn't know like why it was funny. And now I'm like, oh my god, this is genius. So. I did. Um, I did the whole of the American Office again. Whoa. Okay. Yeah. I, We've all been upskilling during lockdown, haven't we? <laughs> so. I, I love the American office. It's better than the English one. I don't care what anyone says. It's so much more funny. And yeah. it the fact that it carries on for however many seasons it is, I don't know what it's seven, eight, nine seasons. Isn't it? Yeah. And they don't, I mean, it does drop off a bit when um Steve Carell leaves, I think. Yeah. But then it does also that like the season that afterwards is a bit naff, but then the seasons following that are all very, very good again. So I'm a like, big fan of the uh that's what is it called? What they do the gift giving and and he puts in an iPod for the Secret Santa or whatever. <laughs> and it's supposed to be like a ten dollar limit and he puts an iPod in. I'm like, because it is there's always that asshole that does that, isn't there? Yeah. Like yeah, one person good. that like ignores the limit and you're like, fuck. It's so there's so many things on that series that are so relatable. Yep anyone that's worked in an office and that's i think that's what i liked about i like about the american office is it the british office is equally as relatable but it's very british humor like mm. i don't think it quite translates so well maybe internationally and also it's very dated humor it's very yeah. top of the time um the american one is a bit more the humor kind of is a bit more timeless and it's maybe this is like a cross-cultural thing though because like i love british humor more than anything Maybe, maybe, maybe. yeah. I think like, maybe maybe I just get fed up with it because I yeah, hear it day to day all the time. Like I also will watch old episodes of Mock the Week from like five years ago and not care that it is like, like I will still laugh so hard and it's like, oh, they're talking about, you know, Theresa May. <laughs> yeah. Have you- and It's still so funny to me. Have you done uh, Taskmaster? Oh my God. Taskmaster, watch it. It's brilliant. Right. So it's the task mark is on, it's now on channel four and mm -hmm. it's basically a TV series. There, there is actually, it has been done in America as well. Um, okay. But the, I've not watched the American ones, but the British ones, I, it, what it is, is it's, you've got uh, a guy, two guys that create, every series is a panel of five comedians basically. Okay. And there's two presenters and they basically do a series of, during the series, the panel of comedians have to do tasks. And the tasks can be very, very, absolutely anything. And they can be, quite often you can interpret the task in different ways because of how it's written. Okay. There's quite, it, the, some of the tasks are quite intelligent. And like, there's a bit where you're like, why the fuck didn't I think that in it? But it is brilliant. Check it out. Probably the kind of like, the yeah. people that are in it is like uh, like Noel Fielding's in it in one series, and okay. uh, there's a real contrast though of like up and coming like comedians and actors to more like mainstream, more well known guys as well. So it's a really good mix, and the the two guys that present it and uh, write all the tasks are hilarious as well. There's just a lot of good banter between them. 
Um, and I think that's on like nine seasons now. So it's been going for quite a while. And they also there's a Taskmaster game, which I will put it out there is probably one of the best Christmas games I've okay. ever played. I'm gonna try to find Taskmaster anywhere in Spain that I can watch it. It's got, it's got to be able to be fun. Um, oh, we are so awesome. I'm now. I feel really bad. All the listeners are gonna be like, they are just literally talking shit about video, <laughs> about movies, and TV. Uh, <laughs> so, on the topic of games, haven't you done a game? Uh, so, two friends in London, and uh, Nathan, as their celebrity spokesperson, created a cycling game called Attack the Pack. They'll be very happy to hear. So, it's actually super cute. They, it's like a. It's a little bit complicated, but it is a cool like card game type thing about cycling. Um, yeah, they had a lot of fun doing it. So, it's really cool, and it's it really. really cool, yeah. I've yeah. not played it, but I've seen, I will probably end up buying it now. To be honest with you, buying it now. <laughs> um, but what I I really like all the little illustrations on it. Yeah, the illustrations were done by a girl named Adrian who lives in London. Adrian illustrates on Instagram. She's super talented, so that was good. There was one that was like kind of Nathan-like, which was cute. So, Aww. so if you don't look it up, if you don't know Attack the Pack, and check it out because it's a pretty cool. Little, like I just think the illustrations are really nice, which is maybe yeah. that's just my m- mentality of liking anything pretty and designed. I just thought it was really like they're nice and fun and friendly. Yeah. Um, and then the one last thing which I'm going to ask, I don't know if I pre-warned you or not, I can't remember, is cool. always ask people for five tips. Did I, I didn't pre-warn you. Five that, tips? Anything. So what I what this can... Tony Yellow Snow? <laughs> that's one. Done. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> and why, the reason why it's always five is because three is easy, Four is hard. Five, the normally the fifth one's really, really good. And I don't always pre-warn people because I like it. How to be, long do I? Have? They can be and they can be anything from don't eat yellow snow, very valid point. Uh, I've had cooking tips, I've had tips to like maintaining your bike, I've had like really deep like meaning of life tips. I've had things which have just literally been like drink eight glasses of water a day. Like it could literally be anything, but five of them. And you've done one already. Don't eat yellow snow. Don't so eat yellow before. snow. Um, and it can be anything from what you've learned from your your life, and, and absolutely anything. That's it. Always, and I, I I've sort of insisted on doing it now because I had so many people complain that I didn't do it for a while. <laughs> I'm still stuck on don't eat yellow snow. <laughs> um, don't eat red snow. Don't eat red snow. I count as two. Oh, that's so gross. That is really gross, but I would cast that as two. Man, I have so, it's just so frustrating because I'm, I'm going to finish and I'm going to be like, oh, I forgot about all of those ones. Um, <laughs> Go on, there's got to be something. Don't let it bad on the spot. That, that's why this is always so good because people you can edit this right you can take out this so it's not like 10 minutes of like long pauses of me being like mm-hmm. yeah, that's cool. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. tip two always buy everything second hand better for everything that's better a- for everything better value you're doing somebody else a favor you're probably contributing to a small business or an individual and it's better for the environment. So that's a great tip. Which I don't know if you saw this morning that Colnago has launched an NFT of a bike, and like I'm crying because nobody seems to understand how bad this stuff is for the environment. I'm like, could you stop? Could could you stop with these stupid NFTs? Like it's not a thing. We're just killing the world. Stop. <laughs> like for it, and I just thought. I think my reaction was. <sighs> <laughs> That's pretty much what I did. That was how that was how I could sum up my reaction. And uh, the caption that they, I, I haven't read like there's a press release or anything, but the caption I saw on social media made me just go, <sighs> again. Because mm. it's Tip, I, yeah. Tip three. Like, go on. All about how you look at things. So don't ever let, so like for instance, you know, I have an American coffee pot in the house because I like to go out and enjoy my coffee and my coffee here is going to go through a filter and it's going to make quantity over quality mm. and it's 12 cups at once. 
Well, you know what I'm going to tell you? I can't find a single difference between that and when you have a pour over coffee in a cafe. It's the exact same process. Yep. I'm sorry. <laughs> so ignore labeling, call it what you want. It's all the same. <laughs> Do what makes you happy. It's just how you look at it. So I was like, you know, I made the, like, I make that joke that I'm like, oh yeah, we have a pour over machine and people are like, ooh, and then they see it and it's an American coffee pot for like 30 bucks. So that's, oh, yeah, I, I'm with that because like I have a cafetiere that I've had for 14 years, I think 14, maybe 15 years now. It's disgusting, but it does the same thing as a cafetiere from anywhere yeah. Like, yeah. and it just works. It's and the it the handle's broken on it. You have to hold it with a, an oven mitt. Perfect. That's fine. It's bright. It, it's red and it's covered in coffee stains and it's a bit crappy, but the coffee still comes out good. You know, the Bialetti, they tell you not to wash it. So it like makes more of a rich flavor. So I guess you're on the same thing. And it's probably like the best coffee you'll ever have for life. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> tip four. I don't know. I've run out again. <laughs> I have no knowledge of anything. <laughs> you definitely do there's definitely <laughs> something about i could think of a fourth one quite easily and it's it's just simply about um always for me from what we've talked about what i think about is that how it's always about like just being positive and like forthcoming and open to talk always about be positive but not on a drug test <laughs> There you go. That'll do. Tip four. Actually, no, there is no drug, drug test you want to be positive on. I was trying to think if there's anything I can think of. Or yeah. not even a COVID test. So, yeah. Yeah, I've had. Yeah, that should be my new slogan. <laughs> Always be positive, but not on a drug test. Um, That's, a, I mean, okay. very true. Very true. Uh, I had to have a COVID test the other day and I don't like them. But... Horrible. They're so, so horrible. The the nose stick is bad enough. The throat, every time I've had that, I think I'm going to throw up. Mm-hmm. It's all so bad. It's like, what are, you, what are you getting out of there? Like, But I understand why, um, you know, if it means being able to see people and stuff, I get it. But it's not an enjoyable experience. And I had to have, uh, I had to have my blo- I had to have blood tests yesterday as well. And uh, I am not good with needles, injections, or anything like that. Close your eyes. I use my mouth mask to cover my eyes. <laughs> my, my partner's a, she's a volunteer giving vaccines to people as well. She's had all the training. You had to go through like a little training with the British Red Cross and stuff. And, she, and she's had all that done. And she's volunteers and gives injections. And she was like, would you let me do your COVID injection when you could have it? And I was like, yes, because... Mm-hmm you could deal with me afterwards. Right. (laughs) Um, But the blood test was like uh, having to, it was just, it was pretty simple. It was just like the pinpricks in the fingers and just having to fill up these vials of blood. Mm. I absolutely hated it. I thought it was going to faint. Literally, I thought it was going to faint. And um, I, and then you just post them away basically. But I, I have very legitimate reasons for not being good with hospitals and doctors, which I'm sure at some point I'll end up talking about. Um, but it's to do with operations that went wrong when I was a kid and those kind of things yeah. are implemented in you for the rest of your life, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, anything medical related, not fun. But we've still got one more tip to do. I know, I was hoping you'd forgotten about that. <laughs> Uh, and now it's the last one. So that's like the hardest. That's like all the, you know, you're going to get like a series of text messages from me after that are like, oh, here's a better one. Let <laughs> me just record a voice note of an even better one. <laughs> I know. I just thought of something way better. Um, I, I mean, where I was going when I was on my slight tangent was uh, talking about how, you know, you're obviously very, Uh, in tune with what's kind of going on in pro cycling and the riders out there and everything like that and what I think is very clear is how you are very positive about that whole situation and who you meet and who you discuss you're never negative about it publicly anyway (laughs) Uh, because because what you can say can be very influential on what can end up happening further down the line does that make any yeah, sense? It makes sense in my head. 
Okay. I mean, I don't know. I think I did have a rant or two about the EFK command. That wasn't necessarily a positive. Ah, that was a, that's a, that's like no. That I don't. I wouldn't class that as being negative. That's uh, raising a point of the situation. Um, I mean, what I mean in the context of like going, you're never, you're not bitching about anyone. That's more. Neg that's a more negative word that I mean. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because I think you can, I don't know, maybe I just feel like everybody has something to offer. So, you know, why, I mean, there's also everybody you meet, there's probably going to be something you don't like about them as well. But, you know, yeah, it's always, everybody has something not offer like physically, but offer, you know, every person that you meet has different experiences that you can learn from and share from. And so just take every, tip is take everybody for, if, face, I don't know, not face value. Recognize that everybody you meet has an interesting and unique story and work out what you can learn from them. Is that a tip? My tips, and I class that one. Always that. save time to go to the beach. <laughs> Which is what you're doing this afternoon. Is what I'm doing today. God damn it. I am, I am not because there's one, no beach near me, and two, it's fucking freezing outside. So, I think that if you were at a beach near you, it would be pretty miserable. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least it's blue skies now. It was pretty grim and overcast earlier, but it's blue skies now, which is... I, I have to be honest, since I've moved here, the every morning and every evening, the sunrises and sunsets have been unbelievable. Like, I, I guess because living in central London, I didn't get that. You just have no. light pollution and noise pollution. Yeah. But since being here, it's been it's my the the house I'm in is a it's a converted textile factory. Oh wow. So okay. Super high ceilings and the massive, massive like floor to ceiling windows and stuff like that. So all the light comes flooding in and mm -hmm. um it's really, really special actually. I'll send you a photo of it later actually, because it's stunning. I mean, I'm sure you'll do a Girona cycling trip at some point to just come to the beach here. Oh man, I am longing to get back to Jonah, to be honest with you. I haven't, it's probably been two years. Shit. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, yeah. It's I mean, I can't weird. imagine much has changed in two years. I know, there's probably another like bike cafe or something that's opened. Probably another bike cafe, prob probably another 10 bike cafes, probably a few more people than last time. Everyone's yep. got a bit older, but nothing. Bikes yeah. have gotten nicer. More people are riding gravel. <laughs> yeah, gra when I, last time I went, gravel wasn't really. I know. I mean, it was kind of starting, but mm. no one was really doing it. Um, but yeah, I I'm very as soon as as soon as I basically already said to my partner, like as soon as it's kind of deemed safe to travel a bit more, I, we're going to go to Jonah. Because you're you're into the gravel thing too, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it's just fun. I know. It's just fun and like, I don't know, I think there's a lot of really good gravel in the UK. There's yeah. tons of it. And I think there's also a lot of really bad drivers in the UK. And mm. you go gravel riding on some of the old like fire tracks and stuff like that. You're just taken away from an element which can yeah. cause danger. And yeah. admittedly, since I've moved up to the Peak District, the driving drivers have been a lot better. Um, yeah. But my comparison is London, where drivers are generally bell ends. I'm, I'm gonna put it out there. Um, yeah. You know, up here when I've been out for rides, you could end a car could be stuck behind you for like 10 minutes and they don't care. Yeah. Just like, yeah, it's fine. But London, it's you know, if someone's stuck behind you for 10 seconds, they get RC. Yeah. Um, I think a big part of it is because the British cycling, um, riders and riders that are in the british cycling yeah. british academy they ride in the peak district a lot because yeah. manchester is the closest like national park so i think there's a lot of like acknowledgement that there's a lot of like high level pro riders riding around here um and uh, yeah, we're I, in the i mean it's quite historical in the north too like i mean tour of yorkshire like look at yeah. the crowds in that I'm so sad that race has got canceled, like, canceled again. I hope it comes back, but yeah, like, like it's really the people really love it up there. So. Yeah, it's massive. You know, 
Yorkshire, Peak District, uh, Lake District, the kind of that that band across the UK. Cycling is it's a massive like pulse of the area. You know, people absolutely love it. They live and breathe it. And I think that that was a big reason for wanting to move up here. Is it's just amazing roads, incredible roads, incredible trails. Like, and people are much more susceptible and open and like it. Quite frankly, yeah. yeah. I cannot eat cake. That stuff's good. <laughs> I'm not. I've got to be honest. I'm not a fan, but I don't really like <gasps> minty things. <gasps> but they've All right. How close are you to that really nice service station? I'm Is not that the people to the lake. You know where I'm talking about, though. Yeah. Okay. It's like uh, my knowledge of Northern England. I'm like, there's this one motorway station that's so fancy. There's a, there's there's a so there's a there's one in Gloucester. Or Gloucestershire, somewhere like that, that is a farm shop. And yeah. it's, that might be the one you mean. No, this is North, this is maybe it's Lake District, T Bay. Where's okay. Gloucestershire? Yeah. 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 I don't know where the Peak District is compared to the Lake District. I get really confused, I'll be honest. Peak is, uh, so Lake District is north, more north. Okay. So Peak District is kind of Sheffield. Okay. So basically, if that's the Peak District, Sheffield is like on the uh, yeah. eastern coast. Manchester yeah. is like slightly north. So Man the the Peaks are the thing that's between Manchester and Sheffield. Yeah, basically. I stayed, I stayed there once in that park. It's really nice. <laughs> I've been there. It's coming. Um, and where I am is a little village in the like the west of the Peaks. Well, I say okay. village. It's a small town, uh, and it's from my doorstep to the the basically being in the peak district is i think two kilometers okay i mean it's yeah. up a fucking big hill but it's good training yeah it's 15k climb and it's got 20 percent plus bits on it so it's yeah but you can go around it but that's the most direct route into the peak district um uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but it, it my coach, my coach's dad live used to, uh, does currently live in the, like a town across from me, and he comes up here anyway for like riding around Christmas and stuff. And he's like, that climb by you is the only climb I've gone up and thought I'm going to stop ever. <laughs> and I was like, this one that bodes well. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Laura, All thank right. you. Better run. All yeah. right. If you need anything else, let me know. If you're like, this is horrible, we got to redo it. Just tell me. So that's fine. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, I send me all when it's going to be out, and then we'll we'll tweet about it and get Legion to go on because they just shared something. That we'll get them on this. So. Have a really good time on the beach. I'm really yeah. jealous. I. What's uh, funny is I'm actually a little bit sunburned from the other day from just sitting outside for too long, and I'm like, mm, but I'm going anyway. So, a slight look at that. A slight bit of color. There, there you go. Yeah, a bit of British sun there. Ooh, bit of British yep. sun there. Yeah, not much. Yep. Uh, we had about five days where it was glorious. Yeah. And that was it. <laughs>